Hey, welcome to Mario Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. That's right. How you been, man? Not too bad. That's good. That's that's, good. that's all I have to say. That's my weekly update. Not too bad. Week you don't you don't you don't have any updates this week? Uh not that I can think of. We have some collective updates. Um Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh I guess well, actually I don't I think we're recording uh, we we recorded a late podcast last week, so like we've it's literally been like three days since yeah. we last recorded. So there's really not much eventful things that have happened. <laughs> but I will say, um, this is a biweekly update. We've been planning some things. We we we've been busy planning our lives. Yes, it's uh, true. We are going to do a live podcast at BYU University. Yeah, in April. So that's exciting. Yeah, it is very exciting. I'm I'm very excited. Um, and shout out to all, all the BYU students who have helped organize it. I think it's called the BYU Synopsis. Is that correct? <laughs> Symposium. Uh, symposium. Design, the BYU Des- Industrial Design Symposium. Oh, man. James, you're the guy who always does this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. So. Um, yeah, if you're watching the video, James pulled it up. But yeah, no, it's exciting. Um, doing a little live pod there. Doing a live pod, doing some workshops. Doing some workshops. Um, and have you ever been to Utah before? I have not once set foot in Utah. I don't believe. I mean, when I was a young boy, uh, my parents took us on a cross country trip around the United States, and I. But I feel like we never went through Utah because okay. we were going around the perimeter of the United States. Oh, uh, but are wanna... there any national parks in Utah that Moab is Moab in Utah? Mm. There's definitely national parks in Utah for sure. Yeah. Um. I, I have been to Utah. I went to Salt Lake City once. Um, yeah, it, how'd you like it? It was cool. Oh, isn't there? Isn't Monument National Park in Utah, or is that Arizona? Oh, there's Arches National Park. There's definitely there's definitely some beauty, beautiful places. Yeah. In, oh, Bryce Canyon, Zion. I've been to both those places. I haven't been to Arches. Yes, Utah is beautiful, and we are excited. Um, and hopefully, we get to you know take a little little day trip out to one I of these love, little places. I love the shape of Utah. Just look at that. I love how like as the you sha- get James- as you get further and further west. The shapes of the states, it's like, you know, w- when it comes to like the east okay. coast, I, I, the shapes of the states are a little bit more abstract. Right. They got like the rivers and things. And, and you just get more and more modern yeah. as you push out to the west. Can I just say that Utah has a notch in it? <laughs> and you're saying you love oh, Utah's God. shape. I would say it's more of a chimney. A chimney. Okay. I guess I don't it's, know. it depends on how you look at it. Yeah. But, but like... <laughs> What, Wyoming is just like a straight up rectangle? Colorado, straight up rectangle? I thought Wyoming has a little thing on it. Does it? I don't think so. Is it doesn't Wyoming even a rectangle? Have a, it doesn't even have like a, like a, a one millimeter fillet on the edge. Um, <laughs> Welcome to Minor Details where we talk about the shapes of states. Montana and Idaho have kind of a funky, you know, they have a, they have a funky borderline going on there. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Hey okay, guys, okay. welcome I gotta, to geography. I got to stop James before we start losing all our listeners. But um, but uh, yeah, no, we're excited. And I also my my another one of my weekly updates is I've officially announced that I'm doing a talk in Portugal. Oh, um, so that's that that'll be an interesting trip. Portugal, Nebraska, Por- <laughs> Portugal in Europe. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, specifically for the National Meeting of Design Students, and it's going to be in Vena do Castelo. And I don't know Portuguese. Your Portuguese I don't know Portuguese is at all. Beautiful, Nick. Uh, so oh my gosh, I think people are going to ask you for directions while you're there. I also am really interested. I, I'm curious what's going to happen when, I mean, when I get up there to do a talk about design in English. Are they going to understand it? Is it going to re- be receptive? Respect? Re- receptive? Yeah. Are they going to be receptive of it? I don't know. Um, I don't know either. But I'm excited for it. Yes, excited, you're, excited for new adventures. You're you know? going to be meeting all of the design students from all over the world. No, just, they're all just coming to the summit. No, just in Portugal. Oh, okay. Well, there might be some like Sp- uh, Spanish design students that come. Yeah, from Spain, maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, I've, I've been planning that trip, and I also thought I might swing by Milan first too. Ah, I might swing by Milan. You know, might take a might take a private jet. No, I'm not taking to uh, <laughs> Singapore. I don't know. You know me. I'm Nick Baker, I world will say, traveler. No, I will say that when I announced that I was coming to Portugal, someone did ask me, like, is James coming? And they were sad that you weren't coming, James. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't fit inside <laughs> Nick's suitcase. We've tried. Um, 
but yeah, no, we're excited for all these opportunities that, that have come up. Yeah, um, it's great. And yeah, if you guys are at design school listening right now, I mean, we'd love to come and do a little live pod or something, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Any, yeah, any IDSA members out there or anybody just uh, looking to shake things up at their local university, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, so not many updates this week, but but some exciting uh, planned uh, updates. So also... Design news time. This uh, this happened last week, right? I think um, the design studio Hallraf shut down, and um, Hallraf was a graphic design slash website web design studio interaction studio. They kind of did like the the gamut of branding stuff, um, and. I don't know if you remember this, James, but we we talked about them on our Core 77 conference podcast. Yes, we did. Um, they spoke at the Core 77 conference last year, and they had a they had a great talk. And I remember speaking or or discussing specifically how I really admire admired the fact that they got up there on stage and just sh- showed their like budget. Like, yeah. Hey, hey, guys, we made you know five hundred thousand dollars last year. Here's our clients. Like, here's how we spent our money and like here's what we got paid and like i was just like whoa you're just being like so transparent you just like got up there and we're like hey here's my bank account yeah it was really really refreshing it was refreshing it was bold um i know that's like definitely can be a bit taboo especially in in the in that you know the the financial things um but they shut down unfortunately um and i think they're just going to move on to bigger and better things but they actually released all of their design studio assets on Google Drive for the public to see. And there's an article on Fast Company about this, um, so you can go check it out. But I was reading through everything today, and it's a gold mine of like studio assets. So if you guys are interested in like doing your own design work or working in consulting or just being independent or it's really any type of creative op- entrepreneur, like this is an amazing asset that you have to check out. Like I was just like going through and they have, you know, it's very well organized. They have like their finances, um, you know, put out into the, the Google, Google drive. And you can see like, Oh yeah, there's their budget. There's how much they spent on rent. There's how much they paid each other for their salary. And then they have like a Excel spreadsheet of like all their clients, you know, which ones they wanted to work with, how much, they uh, they quoted for certain projects like hey this website was like thirty five thousand dollars you know this website was worth you know eighty thousand dollars and I don't know it was just like so beneficial and insightful to someone like me who who's kind of working through some of these things and they had like design contract it just like everything was in there and I'm so excited about it and I sent I sent the founder like a nice thank you but I don't know it's just like just like a, a wonderful thing, a wonderful way to go. Yeah, for sure. You'll have to uh, report back to us on any learnings, yeah. on any on any good learnings. For sure, I will. From the release. But yeah, I urge you guys to go check it out yourself. I think we'll link to it on our website and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we wanted to talk this week since it's kind of in the springtime. Tis the season. Tis the season for internships. It is well to to start looking, yeah, at least. to apply and and get you know get those applications in for summer interns. Yes, I mean James and I aren't going to go intern, but we know that we have a lot of student listeners. So Man, I think what I would what I would give to go back and be an intern, where everything you do is really impressive. <laughs> I mean, we'd probably be good interns, right? Oh my god, I would kill it <laughs> as an intern these days. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think we just kind of want to talk about internships in general, share some of our experiences, and I don't know, maybe talk about like, you know, the benefits, the cons of internships, different types of internships, six months, three months. Um, but I'm, I kind of want to just start off. I kind of want to hear about some of your internship experience, James, and yeah, what you've benefited from. And well, as most people on the podcast know, if they've been listening to us for a while, I didn't really get my first true industrial design internship until I graduated from college. But I did work at my dad's company. And uh, I also mentioned this, I think maybe an episode or two back that my dad owns, uh, runs a rotational molding 
um, facility, but he also does um, some consulting and he designs some proprietary products. So I got to work. Um, I actually worked my way through that that company from factory to to engineering. Oh, that's cool. Um, so, you know, the, wait, what the, were you what were you doing on the factory floor? Uh, well, were I you was actually doing the roto molding. I never got a chance to run a machine, unfortunately, okay. but okay. I was doing a lot of secondary work. So trimming flash and Whoa. like I did pop, not know that. Yeah, doing that kind of stuff. That's kind of interesting. Um, it definitely gave me gave me a lot of uh, empathy to the factory worker because I, I I think that that's something that we don't necessarily. I mean, we do kind of talk about it, but you know, there's certainly ways you can design products that could benefit the factory worker in a way like in terms of the amount of secondary work that they have to do and right. and being intelligent about that right um i think it's good to know about the manufacturing method that you're going to be using and you know but anyway um yeah i i worked i worked doing secondary and then so when i was working there working in the engineering group a lot of the design work I actually did while I was there that summer was designing fixtures for the factory workers. So like while they're doing secondary work, something to hold the products that they were mm. that they were using. And these things were just like were they made out of plywood or like steel or what um, was it? That some of them some of them were made out of plywood, some of them were like these metal like tubular sort of like I don't know what the system was, but they were like you could just kind of connect these things together there were you know it's almost like you see with pvc pipes but they were from what i remember they were metal okay um but uh but yeah doing stuff like that for the people in the factory which was a really interesting experience uh, as well like this whole empathy thing for the factory worker and then like also giving them things and seeing how they were using them and seeing them get really beat up and right. and like really being there alongside your user. This is like full on design research you're doing. Yeah. So um, it was pretty cool. Like I have to say that my first summer there, it was like a really interesting experience. The second summer there, I got more immersed in sort of like the the lean manufacturing stuff and worked with like kind of the, the head of that at, at my dad's company. Um, which was like a lot of like reorganizing workstations to right. like figure out how to like how to make it how to make it the most efficient and also beneficial to the worker and then just like workflows of like taking something out of taking a part out of the mold taking it to secondary like what's that right. trip like and what's the whole secondary workflow what right. does that look like like do you have to do you have to turn around 180 degrees or do you have to turn 90 degrees yeah right? or like how far do you have to lift up the, <laughs> the, the tool and like yeah hmm. it was it was a really cool experience being being that i was so close to where like this iterative process was happening and seeing the effects of it um so yeah, like, and, and I kind of just did a little bit of everything while I was there. I did a little bit of design work. I did a little bit of graphic design. I also, while I was there, one of the big things that I was doing was creating uh, work instructions because they, like, they had a lot of new employees coming in all the time, a lot of temp workers. And so having work instructions at each um, station was a big deal. And I was creating almost like, storyboards mm. for them so Very i was easy to understand right like, yeah so i was actually like having this one guy go through the process of all these different workstations and i was taking pictures of him and then i was kind of like drawing cartoon like versions of him over right, him and right. like clearing out the background so that it wasn't distracting and yeah so i i don't know this is so this is all like kind of the odd jobs of of like working at my dad's company, but kind of par for the course when you're an intern. I feel like you definitely learned a lot that way. Oh yeah. I mean, it wasn't specifically design, like tangible design skills, but I think there's a lot of intangible things you learned. Right. Especially in the manufacturing process, which is super helpful to design. Yeah. And yeah. And just like, just going down into the factory every day and just watching all of this stuff unfold, like, and, and also just like, you know, being exposed to all these different products that my dad was molding and just like looking at them and thinking about 
their design and like sometimes appreciating the design and sometimes not appreciating the design and how I might change things and, and where like parts that were designed for rotomolding, molding, like where there were, you know, uh, parts of the design that weren't great for the manufacturing mm, process, right, especially right. with rotomolding. molding. But yeah, it was, it was interesting. And, and in the interest of not just having me ramble on forever, <laughs> I think, I think it was interesting. I think, bef- I, it interesting. I think before I go on to my first internship, I think we should talk about your first internship. Yeah, my well, my first internship was kind of funny because it wasn't industrial design at all. <laughs> and I, I'm, I believe I mentioned it before in the podcast, but yeah, um, I interned for the Boy Scouts and I interned as in their licensing department. Mm. Um, just as a graphic design intern doing, I don't know, really anything that they wanted. Um and it's it's kind of interesting because license, you know, it, it's not industrial design. Um, I wasn't designing products, but I was in the licensing team, which, you know, not a lot of people are really familiar with licensing. But essentially, what licensing is is when you own a brand, say you own a football team, mm-hmm. you know, you own the Panthers, North Carolina Panthers, right? <laughs> and 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 you want to sell T-shirts for the yeah. North, for the uh, Panthers. Um, the thing is, is that. You're a football team. You're not going to make T-shirts. You don't have a factory that's going to sew up T-shirts for you. Yeah. You're just going to get. You're just going to hire a company and say, "Oh, hey, I will, you know, let you guys use my logo and sell the T-shirts on my behalf, and you know, you give me a little bit of money of that of your profits." Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what licensing is. Is just you know, kind of renting out your brand so that other other companies can, you know, create products and things around your brand. Um, so yeah, I. I kind of like helped the licensing team. I actually did a few product concepts, hmm. um, you know, pitched them out to clients. I think one of our clients or one of our licensees was like a, a toy company and they wanted to do like r- robotic toys. So like how do the Boy Scouts fit in with robotic toys? So like I designed like this robot toy thing that was like in the forest camping. I don't know. It was kind of... What? It was... I, see, this is the weird what part. What is this? <laughs> I know it's is this anywhere can we see this you could but I don't know if I'm allowed to show it honestly although I I, I don't know how many NDAs are on the project or if it ever went through yeah um but yeah it was like interesting in that way because you know the Boy Scouts is is not I wouldn't say it's like the biggest brand or like the the most valuable brand in the sense of like bringing in a bunch of really cool license licensees or licensors. I don't know which what do you call it, but um, yeah, I, it was interesting workplace atmosphere. Hmm. Um, you know, they had an office in North Carolina, and I it was very like eighties, very uh, like office space. If you have if you've ever wait, seen that movie, so it had cubicles. It had cubicles. I had I had a full cubicle. Now, you're well, saying no, <laughs> no, 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 because I actually long for the days of cubicles. I know you do, James. We've had this discussion. How did you feel about cubicle life? Uh, I realized that I don't like cubicle life at all. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I am. <laughs> but but is it more that you don't like office life or is it cubicle life? Cubicle life. Okay. So I, I, I feel like maybe one of the things I learned at this graphic design internship was stuff I didn't like mm. about working in an office because this, this was my first office real office job yeah. right? which was really exciting like yeah. whoa I don't have to mow lawns I can go into a, a place and like use skills to make money um, and what are you saying about lawn mowing Nick uh, well <laughs> I'm allergic to bees so mowing okay. the lawn is like All right. scary fair enough um, but yeah I, I realized that there were some days when I'd go into the office, not say, and there, there wasn't a creative team. It was just kind of me on the licensing team. Yeah. And everyone else was salespeople trying mm. to trying to sell the license. Right. Or licensing managers. I don't know what they're called. People that don't do what I do. <laughs> um, there were some days I'd walk in, sit at my desk, get to work, and then walk out without saying a word to anyone. Hmm. It was very, it was, it was a little lonely at some points. Isolating. Isolating. You know, I was definitely really young and the age gap there was pretty high. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was definitely a great experience of like learning things I liked and right. did, didn't like about working in the office. Yeah. I actually also went on my first office or work trip during that internship. Can you believe that they sent the intern on his very first work trip? 
What was that? We drove up to West Virginia to see the Boy Scout Summit. They like built a huge uh, complex in West Virginia for the Boy Scouts, which I think they do every other year or something like that. Wow. Oh, I also I also did ornament designs, like Christmas ornaments, oh. which makes a little bit more sense than like what were they robots made? in a forest camping <laughs> out. <laughs> what were they made of? Uh, the Christmas ornaments was was just again like kind of a concept to pitch to a client mm. to be like hey you should license our brand and with our brand you can you know create a a, a little ki- boy scout camping in a tent and hang it on your tree so so you were you were proposing yeah. this idea it wasn't necessarily that you were proposing the design itself no it it was more of like an asset for the sales people to be, oh, to show I see. to show like oh hey you know you should you should license our brand because look at this cool thing that you yeah. could do. Um, so they weren't necessarily full on designs. Right. I also did like, just like banner ads and, yeah. and like wallpapers for your computer, like really like basic graphic yeah. design, stuff like that. That's cool. Well, one, you know, one thing to, to go back to that I, that I think is actually a really important part of internships that not everybody thinks about um, is that, you are getting a glimpse into what professional life looks like and you can get a sense of things that you like and things that you don't like. Yeah. And that's where I think that, you know, students that have multiple internships like through school have an advantage because they can kind of more uh, easily or more readily kind of like set a target as to the type of work that they are really interested in doing mm. once they graduate. They get a little taste of everything. Yeah, because uh, that is that is one thing that I missed out on. Well, I mean, I can't say that I entirely missed out on because there was a lot of perspective gained by working at my dad's company and, and like working through the different levels of that organization. Um, but, you know... I didn't really get a sense like because of how few internships I had of the type of place that I would like to work and the type of work that I would like to do. Here's, here's what I, so yeah, I, I really like that idea of like getting little snippets of different type of work atmospheres. Yeah. After I got all those snippets of work atmosphere, I went into my first full-time job being like, man, I just want to mix it up again in three months. <laughs> I, I just really enjoyed that like changing pace of, you know, just doing different things all the time. Mm. Um, I even like, I even like vividly remember telling like some of my people, my friends in Texas this, I was like, yeah, like if I could just be full-time intern and get paid like a really good salary, that's what I would do. I Isn't would love to just go into every company and stay there for three months and then move on. Isn't that what being a freelancer is? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and that's why I think I, I enjoy it is because it's like you get three months of these like, you know, pockets of like, whoa, this is a completely new thing. You're, yeah. learn, you're learning so much. You're enjoying it. And, you know, you're growing really quickly because mm. of that. Yeah. And I don't know if you're growing. You, may, you might be growing in more of a broad sense. Right. As opposed to maybe if you stayed at a place for a long time, you might be growing in a deeper sense. Mm. So that might be a good distinction to make. Hmm. But anyways, I thought that was, that's interesting. Yeah. So I guess moving, moving on to my first real industrial (laughs) design internship, not that I wasn't doing industrial design at my dad's company, but, um, so after graduating, I actually, I, I, I went to Europe for like did the europe oh thing. so you're the european I, boy now oh, oh you're making fun of me at the yeah. beginning of this episode <laughs> <laughs> listen i've put my international playboy days behind me all right, all right um but uh but yeah i mean so uh yeah i did the europe thing right after school did the did the backpacking thing um and then i came back and and at first i was a little it was a little bit daunting and i was i was a little bit I, I don't know. I was I was kind of afraid that like can I can I get an internship? Can I work in industrial design? Like these were the kind of fears that I was that I was having because I had never had an internship and I was like, well, here's this is my life now. What was your year in college at this point? This was this was graduating. I had graduated. Okay, so this is senior year. So this is coming back after senior year, like after the summer in Europe. Okay. Coming back and and what I decided to do was just focus on New York because I felt like 
I needed to have some kind of focus or else it would just all be way too overwhelming. Mm, interesting. Okay. And so I started calling up, you know, firms in New York. Uh, I remember um, a classmate of mine above me, you're above me, Tony Smith, gave a presentation about internships and his whole thing was like, call, 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 like until you get an internship. You specifically call or like, email? Call. He, his he really old, called him up. Yeah, he would call. He would call up places, wow, and okay. I think that that you know, there's there's all these things that you can that you can maybe do to push your portfolio higher on the stack, hmm. and one of those things is to like really establish a connection because it's very difficult to do over email, and you can be so easily dismissed. But if you can get somebody on the phone, like you can at least push your name to the front of their mind right. in a more right. immediate way. That's interesting. Wow. Um, and so you were calling people. So I was calling people and getting a lot of like, yeah, we ha already have an intern. Okay. You know, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Right. But um, I, I again have to give a shout out because I think I have before to, to my friend Reed Schlegel. Uh, the king. You know, he, um, he was interning at Quirky and I was like, hey, you know, uh, could you put in a word for me? Um, and he did, and it pushed my portfolio to the top of the stack, like so that they could look at it. And I went in for an interview, and uh, a week later, they they were like, hey, um, yeah, can you start in a week? Nice. And so, All right. yeah, that was I. I would consider that a very lucky break i like that has ha literally kind of ank that is the anchor that brought me to new york yeah that's awesome um and and quirky we mentioned before but they're like kind of a design studio that takes crowdfunded ideas yeah kind, in a way and they have they Crowd crowdsourced ideas apologies. they went bankrupt and they have recently resurfaced but yes it's like crowdfunding or no crowdsourced and also kind of like a social media like there's a community involved. It's kind of interesting. And it was, I think it was... It, you at had at to, the time, it was like the peak, right? Yeah. When you, were, when you were working there, it was like peak quirky time. You had to pay a bit to to like submit an idea. But yeah, the whole idea was, and, and I've brought it up on my computer so you can see it on, uh, on the YouTube. Um, you know, you would sometimes get napkin sketches. Sometimes people like taught themselves how to do... Like like normal everyday people taught themselves how to do like rough CAD oh, and like submitted ideas. Huh. But yeah, the idea would, would come through. We, you would vote on it. There was like this live, almost like game show kind of quality right. to it um, where you would go live once a week. The company would. We would sift through ideas and we would pick out like the best 10. And then as a company, we would vote on which ones we wanted to push forward. And then um, you'd eventually make them and sell them yeah. under the quirky brand. Yeah. So what? I I cannot say enough good things about that internship. Well, what is is there anything that stands out as being like this one thing I learned was really beneficial? Um well quirky quirky was this place where like I would say all departments kind of had an equal voice in terms of like you know, the ability to to like talk to the CEO and to like make decisions. And, um, but I, I really admired the spirit and tenacity of a lot of the designers that I met there. Um, and like they imbued in me a kind of work ethic, but also a kind of way of viewing design that was not necessarily like, it, it's hard to imbue like a work ethic without that seeming like this idea of, Oh God, it's never good enough. It's never good enough. Like, you know, that it, I feel like that can have negative connotations, but mm. I feel like the way in which quirky approached it, it was still a very positive environment while also being very hardworking. Mm, interesting. So that to me was really encouraging. Um, and I also felt like there was the spirit there of of like just go do it, you know. Like there was a shop there, there was all this I stuff. I love that. I yeah. love that kind of stuff. Just get it done. Yeah, and it was like 
you know, just just go do it. Like you don't need permission, just yeah. go do it. Yeah. And and I think that that also like that has that has followed me throughout all of my jobs like where things are not necessarily like, you know, I, I'm in a place where where things aren't necessarily going that well and I just feel like, you know what? I can sit around and feel upset about this and think like, oh, like there's a better job out there for me or like I can think that, but also think, how can I make the best of this situation? Right. What can I learn from this situation? And like, maybe, maybe there's more, maybe I have more freedom than I realize and I just need to go do something. Yeah, I love that. So yeah, I, I really have to thank Quirky for a lot of the way that I view design professionally, um, uh, you know, every day. Yeah, that's cool. I, so... Okay, so I'll, I'll jump back on mine. Yes. Um, so that my first internship I had after freshman year. And I, it was graphic design because I didn't know industrial design yet. We mm. hadn't started industrial design. Mm. So the next internship, I had actually had a year of industrial design um, schooling. And I went into the summer and wanted something local um, so that I didn't have to like worry about like traveling or getting an apartment and things like that. Um and I got an unpaid internship at this place called Inventus, mm-hmm. which is a small design studio, industrial design studio in Charlotte, North Carolina. Are they still around? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Inventus. Uh, it's E N V. Start with an E. Oh. Uh, and then there's a Y. Yeah, there you go. And go, go back. <laughs> <laughs> go down. Inventus. Partners. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, James is pulling it up on the, the Google, but, uh, you know, a small little design studio in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, it was really cool because this was my first time in the industrial design world. Yeah. Working. And it was definitely full on design studio, a small little firm, you know, in this, like, I think it, they had like a renovated a old train station. So it was like really cool hardwood floors, like really cool windows and things like that. They had this huge wooden table in the center of the studio. Yeah. And I was there with two other designers and I think another intern. And we would just sit around and sketch all day. It was it was so much fun. And I don't know, I just remember like going to work and coming home and being like, man, I just want to go to work again. Cool. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed it. I think the one thing I didn't know was CAD when I was there. So I did just so much sketching during that internship. Yeah. Eight hours of sketching for the entire summer. <laughs> um. And my first product came out of this internship, which was the the dog light. It clips onto your dog's collar, which you can go back. I think we talked about it in an old episode. But um, I, I think one of the biggest things I learned at this internship was sketch. Like my sketching abilities grew immensely during oh, this time. Oh, really? Um, because you know I had two designers there, kind of mentoring me. Two senior designers there, um, Ray and Juan. Um, they were like showing me like, Hey, you need to work on your sketching skills. Like we sketched on 11 by 17, yeah, paper, which I had always done eight and a half by 11. Oh yeah. Um, and then we also sketched very quickly and very loosely. Mm. Uh, so like just like the technique, the techniques we learned at that internship were, I don't know, really beneficial in, in understanding how to communicate an idea as quick and effective as possible. Mm. Um, and I still like talk about some of these things when I when I do workshops and stuff like that. Yeah. One of the ideas was to take an object, like say a coffee cup, mm-hmm. and sketch it in five minutes. Mm. And so, you know, Ray would like time me and be like, okay, sketch this in five minutes. Yeah. And sketch it up. And then he said, okay, put that paper aside. Now take, take three minutes and sketch it up. And I take three minutes and then I, I would put that aside and then take one minute and sketch it up really quickly. Yeah. And as it's getting shorter and shorter, you're like trying to like work out this <laughs> coffee cup. And you know, the 30 second one doesn't look much different from the one minute one. Right. So why are you spending one minute on a sketch that could take 30 seconds? Mm. Um, and I think it, it's been posted about online. I know like, I believe Sam does design had, yeah, re- had I feel recently like kind of resurfaced. I think that Sam t- and Tony, um, on, on the Instagram, our, uh, Oh no, why am I logged out? <laughs> um, but yes, it, it's like a really fun technique to to sketch an object and sl- uh, slowly get faster and faster as you as you sketch. Yeah. Um, and 
and yeah, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed it. It kind of like gave me a beacon of what I wanted to do. Yeah. And like a taste, like you said again. Um, so that was my fun. That was a fun internship. And then, and then you went straight to work after your internship. Yeah. I went, I went straight to uh, lifetime brands after quirky. I, I had one more internship before I started at, in Texas. Um, the other internship I did was hunter gatherer, which is not industrial design. It's a motion media studio. Um, but the, the owner and founder, Todd St. John, uh, does a lot of physical work on the side. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of it's also included in their, in their studio work. Um, but this one was in Brooklyn. So this is like, this is like close to my heart because this was my first experience in Brooklyn. Yeah. This is, this is where I fell in love with Brooklyn. (laughs) Um, but yeah, he, he does a lot of cool work with wood, like cuts up wood, does like stop motion media, you know, for big brands like Google and like Facebook and, you know, New York Times, like a lot of like really, really amazing stuff. Very pretty. Um, and I helped him actually design or, or make his, uh, furniture collection for ICFF. I believe it was 2016 collection. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and you know, this internship was interesting because it was a lot of fabrication. Yeah. He had a wood shop. I was doing a lot of woodworking, you know, making things in the shop. And, you know, I did a, a little bit of concepting, but most of the time it was like, you know, Todd would come to me with his idea and I would sit down and be like, okay, you know, I'll, let me figure out how to make this thing. Mm. And so that was like a, a kind of a departure from industrial design where it's more of like a fabrication problem solving internship. Yeah. Um, I really liked making things and I still really like making things, but I think the thing I learned at that, in, that internship was that I kind of wanted to have the idea too. Mm. Like it's, it's fun to like make your, your own idea and like solve those problems. And it's fun to make someone else's idea and solve those problems. But like when it's your own idea, it's more of like a baby, you know? Right. Right. Um, but no, I, I really enjoyed that. And obviously like, you know, Todd's been a great mentor and I've kept in touch cause now we're, we're both in New York. Yeah. But, um, Nick, do we have any quick tips? Yes. Any like short tips? Now, now that all the students have listened through our internship experiences where we just talked about romantically about them. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think, yeah, th- this would be a good time to like, what are the best ways to get an internship? Because it is hard. I like your idea about calling. I think that's interesting. I also think that's a little bit, it seems a little risky too, but I mean, you're young. It doesn't really matter. I don't yeah. know. Um, just be nice. I, I would also say it's a numbers game too. Mm-hmm. Like you got to just apply to everything you can find. Yeah. And even the places that aren't offering internships, just send a message. They might have like an intern might've dropped out or like, you know, they might have not even thought about an internship and, and they're like, Oh, Hey, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, I think there might be another thing about establishing connections even before, like if we have younger students that are not necessarily looking for internships at the time at, at this time, but you know, are going to be looking for internships down the road. It's like, you can start establishing some kind of relationship with either like designers that you like on Instagram or studios that you like on Instagram, just yeah. like sending them messages. Yeah. Cause that's the thing is like, there is this feeling, and and I remember this feeling so well at IDSA conferences when, when it would be portfolio review time, and it's just like all the employers are getting swarmed with yeah. people, and it's yeah, like, yeah. Uh, like it even it even feels bad as one of those people swarming, right? You know, because you're you're just like these people know exactly why I'm buttering them up yeah. and talking to them, and you know, I think it's nice if you can start to to like establish a relationship that is like a genuine relationship. I really like that idea for sure. I also, I mean, I I think to go on off that there's, so uh, Chris France, one of the designers on Instagram, which we talk about a lot, (laughs) which it's just funny because he's the one that's our Chris France shout out of the episode. Cause he's the one that's really taken this practice into effect. And Mm. he's just been, you know, he's, he's a high schooler going into college, going to, you know learn industrial design but like this advice right here of like just like making connections just like messaging people you know he doesn't do it you know 
in, like in an in annoying way. Like I remember when we first started chatting on Instagram, it was you know just like, hey, how's it going? Like your work, um, you know, just here and there, like just establishing that relationship. And over time, right. you know, like we became friends, and now like, you know, he's got a lot to learn for sure. But like he's even just helped me with some of my work, and yeah. I don't know. It's just like again, it's like persistence and building relationships. I think is a, another kind of like what you're saying i would like to hear his story about his one week internship with with nick baker yeah that'd be interesting i don't really want to i don't really want to call it internship i think it was just more of like a hangout sesh yes i did make him do work though thank Um, you thank you chris (laughs) (laughs) but uh actually this this uh this week we met up with uh a guy that we met at the square one conference uh Henry. henry yeah um on on instagram as uh talented mr ripley yeah, right yeah so you um, know again it's like he just reached out and was like hey i'm in new york yeah we had met him once before and so we're like yeah we'll we'll get lunch but that's also pretty cool it's like you know he took his spring break to like go to this to a city that he would be interested in working at yeah and it's like that's a great way it's like you're not only instead of like going to like the bahamas or something for yeah spring break. I mean, I'm not saying like skip your spring break, like don't do the relaxing thing. But James went to the Bahamas during his spring break yeah. for sure. But I mean, going going to a city where you'd like to work and and getting in front of people, like that's also incredibly powerful. Like if you know anybody that works at a firm in in that place, like going there, getting in that firm, getting the studio tour, like you know, if you if you can do that, like I I would say that that's that can be pretty powerful as well. Yeah, that's good. Okay, a few, just a few more like really nitty gritty stuff. About oh, the, about Nick's por- getting fired up about the portfolio because I was just looking at some today and like, oh gosh, I just made me frustrated. Um, please, when you have your resume, don't include your non-design jobs on your resume if you're applying to a design job because mm. no one really cares that like you worked at a, as a sales associate for like GameStop. But what if they don't have anything else to put on their resume? It's it's unrelated. I'm I as a designer, I'm not going to sit down and be like, "Oh, this person has worked at GameStop." Then that means that means what to me? Well, okay, Nick, I'm going to have to argue with you for a second Let's hear here. I'm, I'm ready for it because ready like for it. like I think you can put like your other work experience. Like maybe it's down at the bottom, but say like this person works at GameStop and you worked at GameStop. Like maybe there's there's like there's an argument to be made that like oh like i also did that job that's a very like, very slim but chance, i though. but i know of situations where interns were selected based on non-design criteria based on like the fact that one of them liked motorcycles that's and, fair that's fair if you, you have know, your interests well no even even alternate work experience it could be something like hey like i did this thing at the boy scouts hey i'm an eagle scout like like it could spark a conversation that, I'm not that saying, did happen actually a ton i'm with not my, saying with my resume i'm not saying make your whole resume like all non-design related but i am saying that like it doesn't hurt to put like one or two jobs i just i, I like when i see like server at, at o charlie's i'm just like what i mean i do like their yeast rolls but <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't understand it nick i don't under, i don't understand your objection to this it just it just seems less professional in my in my opinion i i'll let you guys decide maybe but this, this is, is something you're you talking about the students yeah I, I i think it'd be what else do they have i don't know they have they have <laughs> they have their portfolio and they have their uh oh, their, their school and they have their extracurricular activities i don't know I don't think that I listen, this is we're gonna have to agree to disagree because I don't think it's bad if you put one or two jobs. Like I maybe put, put them in the bottom, like just like as a one liner. Not yeah, not like a yeah, full description yeah, like maybe, part of your resume. Maybe not like a, a ton of space, but it's like other other experience and it's like, you know, yeah. barista or something. But like I put that I was like, you know, I worked at the radio station in college, which I think is interesting. Like, I think it's a conversation starter potentially. And I also put that I like worked at this toy store for many summers, which was actually my inspiration to get into industrial design. So like, I, I don't think that these are bad things. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I definitely see your point. <laughs> I, I see your point. I just don't know about like, I feel like there's, in I, Yes. I guess I would have to see what you're saying and like how much space they are dedicating to this yeah. to like 
to say like, oh yeah, well that's way too much space dedicated to just that. I guess what I've seen is like, it just is literally like sales associate for like GameStop and then underneath it's like, hey, I worked at GameStop, I organized games and like it's like a full part of the resume. Mm. I, I agree, like I think maybe there is a room for something that says like other experience, like barista or like, you know, worked at a toy store, loves toys or whatever. I, I think mm-hmm. there might be some room for that. And mm-hmm. I definitely can see your point. And <laughs> le- I want to hear what you guys think. Yeah, Join I, the Discord. Yes. We have a chat room going, uh, if you guys are familiar. Yeah, join the Discord. Tell us about your first internship experiences and what you got out of it. We would love to hear about it. And uh, tell us what you think about resumes <laughs> and what should and shouldn't go on there. All right. I think that's enough. <laughs> of, that's enough of internships. Let's get to some questions, I think. Yes. Um, let's do it. So we have a voicemail. Oh, we do. Google voicemail. And someone sent in a voicemail. So um, if you guys want to send your own voicemail, the number is 1-646-494-4011. And I realized someone mentioned that the voicemail is only for US. So I don't know if that's, Europeans can call that's it. That's weird. Because w- it, it's I not toll free. I think it was international. I don't think it's, it's not toll free though. So Interesting. I don't know. We'll I, have to we'll, figure something we'll out. We'll figure it out. All right. So this one comes from Caleb. Let's play it. Hey, James and Nick. Uh, my name is Caleb. I'm a graphic designer in Maryland. I work for a science lab doing a design making science look sexy. Mm. Um, so I'm not an industrial designer, but I love your podcast. I love hearing you guys talk about uh, design in general and your approach to new projects. Uh, I have a, a question about kind of like dynamics between designers. Um, as a creative person, I sometimes just, I get kind of self-conscious about my designs, uh, which causes me to be uh, overly competitive sometimes or even jealous of other designers. Um, and that can be kind of harmful for me, just relating to other designers sometimes and working alongside them. Um, I don't know, I'm just wondering if you guys ever wrestle with these sort of things or at least see it in other designers uh, when you're working, especially in the freelance world. Um, yeah, so that's my question. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Uh, I also uh, had a question about James's dating life. On the last episode, he mentioned that he, uh, I think he went on a date every day for a week to learn how to meet people better. Um, I'm also on the online dating world, so uh, I'd love to hear some some tips from the master himself. Uh, Thanks, guys. Love the podcast a lot. Um, And follow me on Instagram, Face the Chaos. All right, thanks. Bye. Thanks for sending that in, Caleb. Yeah. James, uh Let's hear some tips from the, the master. master? <laughs> I I don't know that I have any good tips. I I basically did what would be considered exposure therapy, which was to get over my fear of dating and first dates. I went on four first dates in one week, and I found that to be very beneficial in terms of like meeting new people, getting getting comfortable meeting new people, and uh, yeah, because I was I was single solo for many many years of my life. Uh, up until I moved uh, to New York and I just decided this is a blank slate for me and I'm I'm just going to like, I'm going to treat this like, like a science experiment. Actually, okay, one really good piece of advice I got. Yes. Like from, from a guy that I went to school with, Ayan Bandari. Uh, he told me way back when, he said, you need to learn how to... Uh, like deal with rejection like you need you need to like get go out there and get rejected that seems like good design advice too it's i think it's good all around advice because yeah in the dating world especially like you know you're going to get you're going to get rejected if you're putting yourself out there you're going to get rejected and as much as you can try to remove like not get too down on yourself for getting rejected. Yeah, if you get rejected like a hundred times, it doesn't hurt anymore. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, like you know, the with the internship thing, like rejection is bound to happen, right? Um, and so like learning to just like deal with that in a very he- like you know healthy way, not get too down on yourself, and move on to the next thing. I like that. Um, That's some good advice. Yeah, I thought that that was really good advice and helped me out a lot. I am not the master, but uh, <laughs> but I was talking talking uh, before the podcast about this question to James, and I thought it'd be fun to share 
a little trick that I did one time. Oh my gosh! And not a, not a bad trick. <laughs> no, you're saying it like it's you're saying it like it's bad. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I I liked this girl in college, and mm-hmm. um, to ask her out on a date, I made this little like laser cut puzzle spinner thing, mm. and it was like two sheets of plywood that were laser cut with the the words um, like "Do you want to go out on a date with me?" And they had a little axle in the center, like a little wooden dowel. And mm-hmm. so when you spun it, it mixed up all the words and it jumbled it up so you couldn't read it. Hmm. And I presented it to her, not as like, hey, here's this, like, I have a present for you. It was more of like a nonchalant, like, oh, yeah, I was just at the studio. I was working on, like, this thing. And I just kind of, like, give it to her yeah, just to, just to let her figure it out. <laughs> you know, because designers, I feel like we're always just like coming up with like weird like trinkets and stuff. Yeah, and like you know, just like chatting about the day and like I just like kind of letting her figure it out. <laughs> it was good. It was good. Did, wait, so did she? Did, yeah. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we did. It nice. For a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe be creative. Do a little uh, do a little building. But there was another part of that question. A, a design oh, yes. related part Sorry, of that Caleb. question. Sorry, we got distracted for a second. <laughs> <laughs> do we get self conscious about our designs? Or slash competitive, jealous of others. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're living in the age of of uh, comparison. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, for me, I, I, I definitely am a competitive person, so I enjoy competition. Mm. Um, I know not everyone does, and not everyone has the mindset to, I don't know, see other people's work, be jealous of it, but in a positive way. Mm-hmm. And like in a motivating way, I know that can be detrimental. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I when I see great work, I'm like, oh man, that's so good. I'm gonna beat that. Like mm. it, it motivates me. And you know, not everyone's like that, but uh, obviously, like some of my designs, obviously, I, I I do get self conscious of and like, hey, maybe this isn't the the best design I can make. Mm. Yeah, I definitely don't like competition. I mean, I. I have found more recently that especially in my freelance world, in my freelance life, as much as I can, especially during the iterative parts of the design process, if I can work completely isolated as in from home. So you don't like working with me, James? That's <laughs> the, the problem that I find is like, is that looking over at what somebody's doing and then... I feel like it kind of can derail my thought process rather than just like sitting there with myself and with my thoughts and allowing allowing my ideas to develop in isolation, I find is better for my ideas. Because sometimes like I can see something and be like, oh, that's a really great idea. And then I'll try to like, and then my mind just kind of wanders off about that idea Mm. and not focusing on my own ideas and so i do i do like to work in isolation so that they can just develop on their own interesting yeah because when we work together i usually just look at your ideas and copy them (laughs) (laughs) competition man um but yeah so uh, yeah i can i can definitely relate to that that feeling and i yeah i i personally don't like being i like being competitive in like the sense of trying to be really original but i don't like being competitive and like who can do the best sketch who can do the best like like model like who you know i oh yeah i always think about conceptually yeah i don't really care about the sketches or whatever right so so anyway huh. um yeah thanks caleb yeah thanks for send that in of course if you have a voicemail send it in we only got one voicemail this week so the odds of you getting Shout it out are going to be pretty high. Yeah, come on. One. What's that number? 646-494-4011. That's it. Um, We got another question? We have another question. You want to read this one, James? Yes. uh, We have been... This this question has been in our queue for a (laughs) while now uh, from Kevin Claridge. And uh, he asks... Let's see. As... 3D modeling in VR seems to be gaining traction, especially through Nick's work. I foresee design leapfrogging uh, modeling in VR with controllers and instead see a future in which technology like Elon Musk's Neuralink will directly interface with your thoughts to generate and refine geometry in real time. Basically, the need to learn and acquire a set of skills to generate forms and ideas will be replaced with computing your thoughts. 
a reaction to what is generated into geometry, and therefore everyone will be able to design thoughts. Boom! Dang. Brain explode. Kevin, unfortunately, I think that's so far in the future because I, I, I even even though Elon Musk has been talking about this Neuralink, I doubt that that manifestation of it will arrive anytime soon. Well, James, we're working on a Neuralink right now. <laughs> are you laughing? But we are. Yes, but it's not. I don't think it's the same one that Elon Musk has been talking about. Yeah, Elon Musk is definitely farther visioning farther ahead than what we're working on yeah um but I, we will we will talk about one of our clients that's working on something similar soon yes when when the product's released um but uh this is i, I love this question this is the stuff I, that keeps me up at night yeah i think about this question because i i think about camera phones mm. you know when you think about democratizing creation democratizing design you know, having a thought and it becoming a 3D rendering or something super realistic and anyone can do that because now they have the Neuralink. I think back about like photography and smartphones. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone has a camera on their smartphone. Everyone can take a photo, but that doesn't mean everyone's a photographer, right? Mm. Because that's not, the tools aren't what's valuable about design. It's the thinking process that's valuable. right? Um, so I, I don't think that I don't think that, you know, if everyone's able to design, that'll replace designers. I think that'll make designers more sharp. That'll hone them. Mm -hmm. That'll make them eat, work even harder to, you know, move above the m mediocrity. Right. Yeah, I think what it, yeah, what it will do is kind of remove more meticulous parts of the process that are meticulous because of the rudimentary like either the rudimentary technology or or even just like you know there are some people that know programs like you know the people who are really stellar at key shot like they have a slight advantage over other designers who are maybe a l like they only have a basic understanding of it yeah but if if everybody because that's the thing is like we've talked about this before it's like that one person in design school who's like a beast of a sketcher and it's like oh man like you can't really detect whether the, the design is good or or if the sketch is just really good mm, right 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 and so if everybody is is on the same like playing field it's that actually seems like it'd be better right? I, I think it would be better because it, it would show the concept more if everything looks like a real product then you could easily pick out which product's the concept's actually great. Right. But yeah, I agree with you that I don't think that these tools being open for everybody that you will suddenly see everybody designing. Yeah. I just don't think, I don't think everybody is made to be a designer. For sure. And I also think, I, I my good friend Gabo also told me this as well. He said, everyone already is a designer because all design is is making decisions. Mm -hmm. The difference is that everyone's not a good designer. Hmm. You wake up in the morning, everyone puts on clothes. That's a decision. You designed your outfit today. I, I don't put on clothes. Uh, <laughs> there are, there are uh, I open up my windows and I sing a song and there are birds that come in to, to <laughs> my Cinderella? room. Cinderella. Had mice. Uh, or is that you, Snow White? If you haven't read. Does Snow White have birds <laughs> flying in through the window? Uh, no, it's Cinderella. And uh, that's a story based on my life, uh, if you didn't know. Um, but yes, birds dress me in the morning, <laughs> um, uh, New York City pigeons. No, I, I love this question and I could really dive deep into it, but but uh, but we, 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 won't, we won't do that because I'll, I'll lose myself in, in the virtual <laughs> world. Um, but yeah, thanks for sending in, Kevin. Yes, thank you. Um, and of course, every week we, we like to shout out someone who's doing something really cool on the, on the internet. Oh, yes. And this week I wanted to shout out Don't Take This the Wrong Way Studio. Mm-hmm. Um, they are a Savannah-based, SCAD-based, uh, SCAD-grad uh, design studio. Yeah. Designing really conceptual and interesting objects. Um, and, you know, for example, one of the products just fe recently got featured on Core 77. It's a plunger with a very, with an extra long handle and a little foot stand oh. similar to a shovel. So, 
I mean, this kind of harkens back a little bit to like the familiarism episode that we talked about with our design philosophies. But, you know, it's like using those familiar ele- elements of the shovel, implementing them into a new product and, and voila, look at this crazy plunger. <laughs> it's pretty great. Um, so shout out to uh, Eric Primo did the plunger, but it's it's three guys, um, some really cool products. The one that I, I like a lot is the shot glasses with two small holes in the bottom. Oh, yeah. And so in order to pour a shot, you have to close the holes with your fingers, mm. therefore in, therefore trapping you into taking the shot. You, you can't <laughs> go back. You can't let go. <laughs> you got to drink it. It'd be such a mean trick to pull on a friend. <laughs> um, but yeah, check them out. And their Instagram handle is at studio underscore D T T T W W. Don't take this the wrong way. Well, don't take this the wrong way is the studio name, but they shortened it to D T T T W. All right. But uh, yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Yeah. Uh, subscribe, like, comment, rate, iTunes, Apple, podcast, Google, Spotify. <laughs> Spotify. Um, also, I was checking. I think we're th- number 37 on Apple Podcast top design podcasts number 37 which is kind of cool oh we're making it up I mean, the list we, we're on the we're on the top design podcast list that's pretty cool that's an achievement of something right how many podcasts are there on the list i don't know it stops after 100 but we're, we're beating, number 37 we're beating out at least uh what six or seven for suck at 38 <laughs> i don't know what i don't know what they are who they are um but yeah uh, join the Discord. We have lots of discussion going on there. Yeah, um, it's really exciting. And we're also live on the Discord right now. So yeah. if you join the Discord, you can hear the podcast early. Yeah, that's a little perk. And, and you also get a little behind the scenes. You get some. You get some snippets before and after the that's pod right. that's is right. recorded. Um, and as always, our intro and outro is by Kyoshi the Kid, and I'm at Nick P Baker, and I'm at I Draw and Receipts. Peace out, guys. Later. <laughs>